Thank you for joining us. Our program today will focus on education and technology, and our guests today are Elliot Levine, the education strategist for Hewlett Packard's Personal Systems Group in the Americas. His team collaborates with school systems across the United States and the Americas in general on comprehensive educational technology initiatives that foster 21st century skills. We are on location in San Diego at the ISTE conference and will be joined by other leaders in education and technology following these messages. Tell me everything that's happening. The horse is old Jenkinson. Um, that's Bacon Bacon. He never puts sunscreen on. Never? Because it's Bacon. That is a girl that is friends with the flamingo. And what's this? That's you, Mommy. When a child can create on a canvas as big as their imagination, that's the way it should be. The HP TouchSmart 520T. Only from HP, the world's number one PC maker. With us now is Ellie Levine, Education Strategist of HP. A great pleasure to have you on the show, sir. Good seeing you. Thanks so much. Tell us a little bit about what's new in education with regard to technology. You know, we're at a definite interesting crossroads for education right now because we're looking at a number of new trends and issues that are going to impact it, as well as some real harsh financial realities that are making it quite challenging for schools to really keep up with those trends. For example, we're looking at more of a transition towards digital content, digital testing, but at the same time, the annual budget increases are not what they used to be for schools. They're facing limits to tax levies, to you know, annual support dollars, and limits to federal and state funding to support technology. So it's really a time where they not only have to accept that they need to do more with less, but they really need to do a heck of a lot more with a lot less. I'd like to ask you, where do you see technology in general leading us in the next five years? I think we're going to see a big trend towards personalized learning. To do that, we're going to really need to t embrace meta-tagging, that we're going to have to start assessing students individually, figure out what they understand, why they don't understand it, and instantly map them to personalized learning content based on their innate ability. If they're a visual learner, an audio learner, a kinesthetic learner, and as such, the teacher is going to go from originally someone who used to lecture the same material to all of their students to now the teacher who becomes kind of a facilitator or a tour guide that gives and assists every student with their own personal learning experience over the course of their career. What are tech companies doing these days to support the educational systems throughout the country and worldwide? Technology companies really have a responsibility to school systems that they work with. Because in the past, there's always been the emphasis on what's the ideal device? How can we equip, equip the classroom that it looks great on a tour? But at the end of the day, it's really always got to be first and foremost about student outcomes. How are we going to move the needle academically that students are going to gain greater subject mastery? They're going to be, you know, being able to apply this knowledge that they're going to be successful not only in their academic careers, but in their professional and personal lives as well. You know, at HP, when we work with districts, the device is probably the last thing we think about. We tell them first, tell us what your educational outcomes are. Then let's go and pick the greatest content and tools to deliver that. And then lastly, we're going to right-size the technology to make sure we pick the right approach that's going to encompass everything you want to do. The problem, unfortunately, is that a lot of schools have what I would refer to as OCOSS. That stands for obsessive compulsive, ooh, something shiny. Because they get very fixed on a particular device or a particular technology. And they say, let's build a program around this. When you do that, unfortunately, it limits what tools, content, and resources you can use. In turn, that limits the educational outcomes you're going to have. So we say, make it the last thing you decide upon. Because you know, we've got such a breadth of technology we can adapt to any school system's environment to provide them what they need. And we see that not just here in the United States, but we see it on a global level. Because what we do in one district can vary in just the next school system right next door or in the country right next door. Elliot, what kind of technology products do you believe really make a difference to students? You know, that's, that's the greatest thing of all about working at HP. Because I can go into a dozen different districts and I can see that the technology they have embraced is completely different. You know, 
There's the whole power of touch and gestural computing. And devices like our TouchSmart PCs have been very engaged, especially in early childhood elementary school students. Um, thin client technology, embracing clouds has been very effective and, and you know, quite engaging for schools because they can deliver any application, any content, anywhere, including remotely uh, to students at home. The new one that's really gaining in popularity is what we call HP Passport. And that's an internet capable monitor for a very low price, allows simply to plug in, connect to the internet, and give you a complete internet browsing experience. And yet the school doesn't have to worry about students downloading malware or spyware because it's a Linux based browser that simply refreshes itself every time the unit is engaged. So very cost effective and very stable where security or manageability is an issue. The other device that we've seen growing interest in has been the whole line of HP's new Ultrabooks because schools looking for ideal one-to-one -one devices. They're looking for smaller, more compact, yet more powerful machines capable of handling full high-end processing power. So devices like our Ultrabooks, we're seeing with their full Core i5 technology, students can carry around a very lightweight computer, yet it's capable of handling the same sort of technology found in everyday computer labs for typically you know, under four pounds. So th there's such a breadth right now, and it kind of makes it exciting because it's no longer just you know, a vanilla or chocolate ice cream approach to technology. There's so many different flavors to choose from that schools can really sit back and have the luxury of choice, not just based on their personal educational outcomes, but the needs of every individual classroom can be very different. What we're also finding is that in addition to everyday computing needs, there's this increased demand for high performance computing, not just in the sciences or traditional engineering, but in the visual and fine arts as well. And what used to be called STEM, we now call STEAM because there's an inclusion of arts education in there as well. And to do that, high performance workstations are growing in popularity. They used to maybe exist, you know, a handful of devices in a shop or a technology class. But we're starting to see labs of high-end workstations appearing not just in high schools, but in middle schools as well. Programs like Project Lead the Way that really embrace you know, high-end engineering education are really starting to become a staple in more schools around the country and around the globe. So we're starting to see devices like our small form factor workstations and our new Z1 all-in-one workstation really start to become a fixture in more schools. This is most interesting. Please tell us more about that. You know, one of my favorite TV shows uh, was House. And, you know, despite all the craziness of that show, what I found most interesting is when you had a sick patient, they, the emphasis was never, well, how does this patient compare to the health of the next patient in the bed next to them or across the wing or at another hospital? It's always about how do I make this patient better? And with this technology, we're able to start doing that for students. Because rather than focus on student achievement, what we're really talking about is student learning. Because it's really about the individual opportunities for students to better themselves. And that's the opportunity here with technology. Because honestly, you know, what I call adaptive diagnostics is a whole new approach to how we test and assess student performance. You know, up until now, a lot of digital testing is very similar to what we would find in bubble sheets. There's no difference. And even the extent of adaptive testing today very much says if I get a question wrong, I'm going to give you an easier question. So ultimately, I, I may not be good at math, but I feel more confident about myself. So the United States, we may be 26 in the sciences, but we're first in self-confidence. So that we know we're not doing well. But honestly, we can go a whole new level. We can figure out not only what a child understands, why they don't understand it. And we can start to give them instantaneous direction to how they can learn that concept and apply it. That's the difference between student achievement and student learning. Because in all honesty, if we can get out of the way, let teachers do what they do best, that's where learning is going to happen. And we've put too many obstacles in the way of teachers to get the job done right. So what we need to do is get them the resources they need and step back and stop stepping on their feet. Interesting. Elliot, a term we hear sometimes is BYOD, bring your own device. Tell us what that means and what your thoughts are on it. With a lot of the financial challenges that schools are experiencing today, the idea of being able to go from five students for every one computer to a true one-to-one -one environment 
is beyond the financial means of many school districts, or at least so they think. So the first thought that comes to mind is let the students buy and bring their own devices. But just kind of opening the floodgates and telling students to bring whatever they want invites a whole host of problems. You know, for example, you have to look at how am I going to manage and secure all these devices in my school? Because I need to filter the internet access for students on my, you know, on my network in order to comply with E-rate funding here in the U.S. Not to mention, if they're connecting into my wireless network, they could be bringing in a whole host of viruses and malware and spyware that may be on their machine already from personal use. We also have to recognize there's going to be a number of students that are not going to be able to afford technology. And we want to make sure that we avoid the stigma associated with, oh, that student's got the free computer, and it stands out like a sore thumb. We need to also standardize, because not every machine is capable of doing what every other machine can do. For example, a number of the publishers have a lot of great digital content, but it's done in Flash. And if students are coming to the table with a device that isn't capable of running Flash, does that mean that you can no longer provide Flash content because some devices don't have it? The other thing to recognize is the burden it's going to play, not just on you know, electricity and wireless networking, but do you have all the policies necessary in place to address what BYOD is really going to mean for your school system? You know, if a student abuses technology at school, traditionally you might take away their access. But if it's their own personal machine, how do you handle that? Not to mention the break, fix, and technical issues that come across when a student says their computer stopped working. How are they going to handle that? And a lot of times, BYOD ultimately doesn't save a district any money. It just reallocates it, and they still find they're spending a lot more to support it. What advice would you give to schools that are implementing technology in their classrooms? You know, you really need to start looking beyond your backyard. What I find when you look at a lot of the, the technology programs, no school system says they want to have a lackluster technology program. They usually use the terms like state-of-the-art, cutting-edge, world-class technology. But at the end of the day, what they often do is they'll look to the district on this side of them, they'll look to the district on that side of them. They take a little of both, slap it together, and that's their new technology initiative. And you know, as we learned from Albert Einstein, you know, insanity consists of doing what everybody else has done and expecting different results. So I invite students and school systems to really reach out. The great program you're looking for may be next door, but it could be in another state, it could be in another country. And where we found that the most, you know, the, those people that embrace opportunities and ingenuity the most are the classroom teachers, because they seem to have no problem reaching out to a faculty member in another state or country for an effective lesson or an effective technology use that has really helped them to address social studies or science or mathematics. So, you know, faculty are really at the, the, faculty are really at the front line of making this happen. And we really need to see districts embrace that same sort of open mentality, that they're open and looking for different opportunities, recognizing that the best idea could be around the globe or in their backyard. I also think it's very effective that when districts are looking at any technology initiative, they really have to focus on stakeholder relations first and foremost. From the moment they decide that they want to do a new initiative, the first thing they need to do is engage the teachers, engage the students, engage the administration and staff, engage the community, and get everybody to really share in this vision. Because that's the difference of a program that's simply based on a superintendent, a board member, one or two people, and instead becomes part of the culture. In, in school systems that have done that, the teachers are usually the ones in the front line out there trying to find the best resources possible because they know they're part of a culture that's about to embrace this technology. It's also one where they're willing to embrace failure. Because guess what? It's technology. And the mistakes are going to happen. If the culture allows for and encourages creative mistakes, we all know that we learn more from our mistakes than you know, from you know, absolutely having every program go just right. And, and that's why that sort of stakeholder relation is so essential. Dr. Abraham Fischler is the President Emeritus of Nova University in Florida and elsewhere. 
and his vision is each student is the classroom. His views on transforming education are quite profound. What are your thoughts with regard to transforming education? Even just a few years ago, teachers were the center of the classroom universe, and it was a very teacher-centric environment. And with technology today, we're really putting the emphasis on each individual child. And that's what they say, the child is a classroom. And we've seen programs around the country such as the, you know, the, the school of one. And what we recognize is that leveraging technology allows us to personalize learning. So it's not one teacher doing a lecture for all 30 students, but instead providing unique learning opportunities for all 30 children at the same time. And we can do that through personalized learning. And that's a stretch for a lot of folks because when we used to go from just you know, one to all, the idea of differentiated learning would, might be we kind of customize for three different levels of you know, adoption. Now we're talking about one to 30. It's a very different environment, but what we do know is it's most effective for the student. And now the technology is here and you know, we're embracing this sort of personalized learning, personalized assessment. That's where we can really embrace the concept of a student-centric classroom. And that's where we're going to see the greatest increases in student achievement. Edith, this has been most interesting. Thank you so very much for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure. I had, a, I had a great time. Thank you, sir.